Good evening, everyone. We have officially reached the seven o'clock hour. So I'm going to get us rolling. I uh, want to officially welcome you uh, from the Children and Family Services Training Center. Um, myself, Amy Elke, and Deb DeWitt. So we're excited that you've joined us for this evening of training. Uh, we'll let you know a little bit uh, in regards to the evening. A little bit different if uh, you have tuned in for some of our past webinars. Uh, tonight will be a little bit different. There are some pieces that will be very similar, so we can talk about those first. Uh, in regards to those training hours, for those of you that are uh, indeed wanting credit for your time here tonight, uh, if you're looking for foster parent training uh, for continuing ed, basically what we do is I get a list of participants who have joined on live tonight, and um, I will then in turn email those to your licensing worker. Uh, with that being said, that includes kind of our, our county zones, as well as treatment foster care path, Lutheran social services, youth works, uh, tribal partners as well. So all of those late licensing agencies will receive a copy of, uh, of who all attended this evening. Uh, if you were tuning in for the recorded session, uh, we are recording this evening um, in hopes that we can reach those who aren't able to join us at seven o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, and with that, uh, if you're tuning in and want the licensing credit, um, it would not count as a face-to-face. -face. You could count that as an online training. But you are wel welcome to work with your local uh, licensing agency to kind of figure out a plan, whether that's you connecting with that licensing agency to kind of report what you learned tonight or having a, a verbal dialogue with them. Every agency does that, that reporting a little bit different. So if you're watching the recorded version, I encourage you just to connect with your, your licensing agency to work out that plan. We will be sending out an evaluation for those who are attending live. And in that evaluation, um, there will be a certificate um, kind of at the end after you complete the, the feedback portion, there is a certificate that you can download for your records. Um, that is just a, a verification of your attendance here. If you're looking for a social work certificate uh, for only the live version, I can't offer that for the recorded session. Um, but if you're looking for a social work CEU certificate, that is something that you can write in the chat box that you need that certificate, or you can email me and I can cross-reference that with our participant list and uh, can email you that certificate in the next few days. So that's kind of how we'll, we'll cover uh, the, the training requirements in that regard for verification. Um, this evening, we do have well over 200 people uh, on. And when I say 200 people, it's 200 households. So we're at like 240 almost uh, individual logins. So with that, some of those are two-parent households. So we're probably at about 300 people uh, potentially in tonight's session. With that being said, no different than other webinars we've held, um, live webinars that is, uh, we will not be able to use kind of the, the unmuting and, and, and kind of dialogue back and forth uh, in that regard, um, as well as we won't have cameras on um, for, for that piece of the training. Uh, nonetheless, we encourage you to have dialogue through the use of the chat box. So with that, it's usually kind of that, that beautiful kind of I always kind of say it's kind of like a, a cartoon bubble, right, uh, that, that we see in the beautiful cartoons. And with that, you should be able to, to click on that and type in the comments uh, in that regard. So you can, you can practice that now and give a little hello to the group if you'd like. Uh, but nonetheless, you can go ahead and, and offer feedback, uh, questions, comments, all of that through the chat box. So all of those are kind of our standard typical uh, ways that we we offer training kind of through these webinars, the Children and Family Services Training Center. This is where it gets a little bit different though. Okay, so I want us to kind of hit, hit pause for a moment because we do understand that in the last few days, uh, our sense of normalcy, right, has changed dramatically. Uh, the notion of COVID-19 has um, paused some businesses, it certainly paused our formal education system, you know, uh, closed places of worship, that sort of thing. So uh, we're sitting in this uh, beautiful, and I use beautiful um, in, in a little bit of a sarcastic tone, right? Uh, beautiful mess um, where we have a lot of uncertainty right now of what's going on. With that being said, it's an unprecedented time for us to figure out where this journey is going to take us. None of us know where, where kind of the light at the end of the tunnel is. And um, with that, um, myself, uh, along with Deb, kind of pulled together and said, you know, is there any way we can help uh, foster families uh, navigate through this? 
So as we kind of move into this un unchartered, unchartered territory, uh, we, uh, I we don't plan to have all the answers through kind of this webinar series. This is the first in a set of series. We don't know what that final number to this series will be. You know, when we laid out series before, it's like, oh, here's the first of four because we had it all perfectly planned out. This doesn't really have a perfectly planned out um, plan. Uh, it literally is, literally is uh, us shooting from the hip and trying to be responsive of what's going on. So when we say press pause, it's kind of a twofold thing, okay? So part of what we're gonna ask you at the end of tonight's training is, does this fit for you? Does this kind of cover what you need? As well as, um, you know, are there, are there other topics? Are there other ways that you want us to continue to kind of be responsive? So we're gonna ask for your feedback at the end of, of does this fit for you? And, and if so, what do you want us to cover next? Where are those areas of, of need um, for you in your home? Secondly, um, kind of the other point I wanted to, to make uh, is we're, we'll make some generalizations in tonight's um, training. And with that, we know that parts of it may fit very well for your family and the kiddos in your home, um, and parts of it may not. Parts of it, um, you know, may not, may not fit at all, right? Because every family, every child, um, everyone has kind of that uniqueness. So with that being said, take what we share as food for thought. Take in what resonates with you. Um, if pieces that don't resonate with you, maybe process that with your caseworker. At the end of the day, um, you know your family. You also know um, a lot about the children um, that are in your care or child in your care. Um, and so we really encourage you to um, connect with your um, child's case manager to, to kind of walk through if things are um, needing kind of further direction, if you're needing further support, if things aren't going as planned. Well, you know, none of us going as planned right now. But if you are needing those extra pieces of support, we really encourage you to connect with your child's caseworker about that. So with all of that being said, uh, the only piece we do have planned is that we're going to move on formally to our next part of training. Um, so if you, if you have um, further comments, further questions as we go on, please feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, we're excited to kind of roll out this evening of training. Um, with the with the hope that pieces of this fit for you, but uh, um, take a moment to pause and and process that to see what fits for you and what doesn't. So, with that, I think we can go ahead and get the evening started with training. Um, I again thank you for all tuning in, and I'm going to now pass it over to Deb. Hi, and welcome to all of you foster parents out there. And anybody else who happens to be listening. So we might have some child care providers, we might have some social workers, we might have some parents, whoever it is that is tuning in, we would like to welcome you to what we are calling Emergent FC or Foster Parenting in the Pandemic. This program is being brought to you by the University of North Dakota Department of Social Work, but more specifically through the Children and Family Services Training Center. Uh, the Family Services Training Center trains foster parents and social workers in issues of tr child welfare, and they are the ones who are responsible for bringing this to you today. My name is Deb DeWitz, and I am the owner of a small business called Family Resource Consultants, through which I do what we call real people videos. Now, you might be asking, what's a real people video? Well, most people create podcasts or videos or whatever you want to call them um, after they have a lot of thought and after a lot of preparation and a lot of editing but those are very expensive and they take a long time to make we on the other hand were interested in creating something very quickly that would respond to what's going on right now it won't be perfect i will probably cough and sneeze and my cat may even come on camera but what's important is it's going to get done and it's going to get out to you when the need is great and when you, when you want it and when you want some help. So that's why we are here. And uh, a big hats off to the Children and Family Services Training Center, who also partners with the uh, Division of Family Services, North Dakota Department of Human Services. And thank you very much for this opportunity to take a look at some things that we hope might be helpful to parents and foster parents as we move through this very life-changing time. Now, I always try to teach through stories. I've never had somebody come up to me and say, I've never forgotten the lecture you did, but I have people come up to me and say, I never forgot the story you told. So the whole point of tonight, this introductory session, is to help us to keep our eye on one particular goal. 
Now, I'm going to tell you a story my dad uh, about myself when I was growing up because this is a story that stuck with me through my life. When I was a younger uh, girl, when I was living at home, a teenager, I worked for my dad on the farm. And one year, my job was to swath the grain, in other words, to cut it down for him with a machine called a swather. Now, it was one of those years where crops were really poor, so nothing got very tall. So, of course, I wanted to make sure that I, that I cut it as close to the ground as I could so that none of the grain would get wasted. So I was running the, the mower part of, or the swathing part very close to the ground to get all the grain. The problem is that when gophers make a hole, there's a mound. And when the swather would hit a gopher mound, then it would swing this way and swing that way. And so even though I'm trying really hard to do a good job, I never looked behind me to see how it was turning out. So that noon when we came in for lunch, my dad said, you know, Deb, I really appreciate your help, but I got to tell you that a snake would break his back trying to follow your windrows. In other words, trying to follow my path of where the grain was lying. He said, much as I appreciate your effort, you're focusing too much on what's right in front of you. And what you need to do is when you turn the swather around and you're starting on a new row, you can't worry about the fact that it's not been a good year and just and just try to focus on what's right in front of you. You just have to pull the swather up a little bit higher and things are not going to be perfect. You're not going to get every grain uh, that's there, but you just got to find a post at the end of the field. So look down the field and whatever's straight across from you at the end. So there might be a post or a bush or a tree and just keep your eyes on that tree and just go straight toward that tree. Don't pay so much attention to whether there's a little bit of a dip or whether the grain is shorter there. He said, just keep your eye on that goal of getting to the other end and having the wind row straight. And even though my dad was just talking about that year when there was a drought, and even though he was just talking about farming, I've never forgotten that story. Because too often in my life, I get to focusing on the, the little things that happen in my everyday life or the small goals, and I, and I think I've got to be focused on those, and I lose sight of what's the overall really important thing here. So I'd like you to keep in mind this picture, because what is our job? Our job is to get from here to the end of this pandemic, and to get there in the straightest path we can with the major goal in mind. Not to, get, not to get carried away with all the little things that may come up from day to day that we think are big. You know, there was a book once that somebody wrote called uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff. That's really what this is about. That we're gonna try to help you to focus on what's really important as foster parents during this very challenging time. Now, I'm going to start by saying, this is not what we signed up for. Am I right? So you, you decide you're going to be a foster parent, and you thought, oh, this will be great. I'll add some kids to our life, right? Our normal life. Now, for most of you, you know it would change your lives, but it would mostly change your life from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, if that's when you worked. Kids would go off to child care and or school, and you would go off to work. Now, you might work a, a different schedule, so you might have other, uh, other schedules, but you get my point. You had an idea of what it was going to be like to have your foster children around. And we thought, we are going to change the lives of the kids who need it. We are going to help these kids who need it. But we are also going to have the support of all kinds of professionals, social workers, psychiatrists, teachers, partnerships, counselors, respite care, courts. We're going to have this whole group of people who are going to be there to support us. That's what we thought. Uh, this is what we got. Yeah, what we got is we're trying to work all day from home. We are home all day with the kids who are supposed to be at childcare in school. And now people are telling us You've got to teach them? I didn't sign up to homeschool. I don't have a degree in teaching. And let's be honest, many of these kids have academic problems or problems that manifest themselves in the classroom. And the teachers even struggle with these kids. And now I'm supposed to teach these kids? This is not what we signed up for. But this is what we got. 
and we're supposed to do this in isolation, right? The, the helpers, the providers are all trying to work out of their homes and their kids are in the background and they're trying to do all these same things. And much as they want to help, they can't run out to help us. They can't stop by to see us. There is all of this stuff going on. We did not know we would be parenting traumatized kids during a time of a nationwide trauma. But here we are. So what I'm gonna tell you is that the Children and Family Services Training Center and Deb DeWitts do not have all the answers. Nobody does. But what we wanna do is we wanna join with you right now as it's happening to see if we can help you find the post at the end of the pandemic field, right? Uh, when people are going to go on a plane, they take emergency. Well, we're thinking this as emergent FC, right? The emergency foster care, right? What is the post at the end of our field as foster parents? Now, we hope that this is the first, well, maybe it'll be the last, but the first, if they are useful, in a series of podcasts for video parents. In this series, what we will try to do is to provide some professional support to address some things that are important to remember, to help you survive emotionally, to especially help you to understand the behaviors you are seeing and the behaviors you are going to see, because there are more ahead. What we wanna also try to do is to help you make the biggest difference in these kids' futures. Remembering again, we can't just look at the day-to-day. -day. We gotta look at that tree or that post at the end of the field. What will make the most difference in these kids' futures? We're also gonna have a little period at the end where we're gonna to listen to your concerns. And one of the things we hope to help you do, not so much tonight but or today, but in a future uh, podcast, is to talk about how you can prevent some behaviors. Now, when I say that, Please note that I'm saying we're going to focus on the antecedents. And you're all going, what antecedent? What's that? Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to focus a little differently than a lot of people do on how you help kids change behaviors. Now, let's be really clear, right? Uh, let's talk about what we want to try to do. We are not going to try to convince you this is easy. We're not going to try to convince you that we know what you're going through. We are not gonna to try to give you a recipe for making your kids, whether they're bio kids or foster kids, do what you want them to do. Man, if that recipe were there, if there was an easy recipe for getting kids to do what you want them to do, we would never have to have a second parenting class. So we're not gonna to try to pretend that we have that kind of answer. We are not gonna to try to give you answer for things that are not known or are unknown, meaning that we don't know anything about the medical part of this. So we're not addressing that. We're not gonna to try to tell you what to do. We are more interested in helping you to learn more so that you can make wise decisions about what to do. And we are not going to try to convince you that you can stop trauma-related consequences. This is a really important one. We are not gonna to try to convince you that there is anything you can do that will stop your foster children from having trauma-related responses or behaviors. In other words, if you think that somehow, when you tune in, we're gonna say, if you just give your kids this consequence, they'll stop acting out. No, it's not how it works for kids in general, but it most assuredly does not work for kids who have had a traumatic background. So, speaking of that, what is different about parenting, at least most foster kids? Well, for many of us, we start with a temptation to parent either how we were parented, because we look back and we say, well, it worked for me. This is how my parents parented me. So then we think, well, I should work for my foster kids. Now, that means you may want to do what your parents did, or you may want to do what worked for your kids when you were raising your kids. But let's take a look at that assumption, because here's the deal. You were not removed from your parents. Well, at least most of you probably weren't because being removed from your family is a trauma in itself. Even if you know someone who, who did not get removed from their parents, but who had a parent die, or if you look at, the, at the, what we know about kids who go through a divorce, it is, we see changes in behaviors 
when a parent leaves the home, even if the child stays in the home with one of the parents, there is a change of behaviors when parents divorce. So imagine how much more significant it is when a child is removed from their home, put in the home generally, not always, but generally in the home of a stranger. Now, you may have been traumatized in your childhood. I'm not saying that we don't have foster parents or other people who are listening to this broadcast who don't have trauma in their background. You may have been raised in a home in which there was abuse or neglect. But if you were, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't carry some stuff with you because you might have one of two reactions if you were raised in trauma. First, you might get trauma and you might be more compassionate, which is great. Or if you were raised in trauma, but you survived, sometimes what we find is it's what they call the farmer smoker <laughs> syndrome, where somebody who went through something themselves now is less tolerant of others, like the former smoker who is less tolerant of people who still smoke. I know I'm not supposed to touch my nose during the pandemic, but I'm talking to you all in my nose. It's just, see what I mean? This is not a real perfect video. It's a real people video. So you survived abuse and neglect. So somehow you think that these kids should just snap out of it. So, you know, if you didn't grow up with a lot of trauma in your background, that's great, but then you might not get traumatized kids. If you grew up as a child who had some trauma, you might get it, or you might think they should be able to do what you did, and that doesn't always work. But here's the deal. It's not just important who you are and what you thought about how you should raise kids. It's important who they are. So let's take a look at who they are and why that matters. Now, tighten your safety harnesses because later in another of these podcasts, we're going to take a look at who you are and how that's going to impact you as you try to parent these kids through this pandemic. Most important point on this slide, this group of kids has already lost at least one family. They have lost a family once. Some of them have lost more than one family. Some of them have been bounced from foster home to foster home. So some of them have had many, many losses. That makes them a special group of kids. Now let's talk a little bit about foster kids in general. Foster kids are in foster care for very specific reasons. When I usually ask, why do kids end up in foster care? The audience says, well, because of parental abuse or neglect, or because of the child's own behaviors. Well, that's kind of true, but it's not really accurate. What we know is that almost all kids who are in foster care are in foster care because of parental chemical addiction and or mental health issues. So either addiction or mental health issues or both, those are the issues for the parents. Now, the other thing we know about almost all kids in foster care is that their families live in poverty. Why is that important? Well, we certainly have people who have money who have chemical addiction or who have mental health issues. But if you have money, you are more likely to be able to access adequate mental health care, adequate mental health treatment, uh, some kind of chemical addiction services. You are going to have other kinds of, of, uh, of resources to resolve some of those issues. So what we know is that most of the kids you have in your home for, in foster care are there because of things that are outside of their control, because of the parental chemical addiction or mental health issues, even if those things haven't yet been diagnosed or, or clarified, um, and because that family lives in poverty. But let's go back and take a look because in reality, parental chemical addiction and mental health issues often lead to poverty. So for some people, the being in poverty comes about because they have very, very serious chemical dependency or very serious mental health issues. You know, once upon a time, when we said the word cancer, everybody went, ah, death. Well, now we know that there are many kinds of cancer. Some are much more treatable than others. Now, when we say chemical dependency or chemical addiction, people think it's all one thing. 20 years from now, we're going to know that's not the case at all. So when someone says, well, I was able to give up drinking or drugging, so if I could do it, everybody should be able to do it. That would be like saying, well, I got over this kind of cancer, so anybody who has pancreatic cancer should be able to get over theirs as well. It's not the same. 
So we know that some people's chemical addiction or some kinds of mental health issues can lead to poverty for these families because of their inability to stay straight, stay straight and sober or to stay on their uh, mental health medications. But it also goes backwards. Four can lead to three. So people who have fallen into poverty for some reason and uh, are more likely to take up chemicals are more likely to end up with mental health issues. Now, if we have one person who falls into poverty, they may have a support system that can help them. So somebody might say, well, yes, but I fell into poverty after, like, for instance, I fell into poverty after my first divorce, but I had a support system of people who helped me. But what about when large groups of people fall into poverty? So you look at what happened to black people in this country, what happened to Native Americans in this country, and they fell into poverty uh, because of the, what was going on in the larger society. And because of that, there's a great deal of chemical addiction and mental health problems. So three and four are so interrelated that we really can't separate them very well. Um, so if you look at these three things, parental chemical addiction, parental mental health issues, and poverty, these three are the perfect storm that creates the need for foster care. Now, here's another thing to remember. Please remember that mental health issues like your height, the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, like all kinds of things about you, you got from your parents, right? Mental health issues are genetic. So many of these kids have the same mental health struggles as their parents. They're just at a different age. So it isn't just that these kids have behavior problems. Many of them have significant mental health issues. Now, if you think mental health issues are just, well, it's all in his head, he just needs to, you know, pull himself up by his bootstraps, just needs to get over it. That'd be like saying to somebody who has high blood pressure, just get over it. Somebody who has diabetes, just get over it. Somebody who has cancer, just get over it. Those are medical issues and mental health issues are medical issues as well. So what have you got? You've got the perfect storm for foster care placement, parental chemical addiction, parental mental health issues, poverty, leads many kids into foster care. Now, this perfect storm, even if it didn't lead kids into foster care, also creates a lot of trauma, a lot of what we call PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's take a look at what happens in that perfect storm and how that is related to trauma. So most foster kids come into foster care with what we call a very high ACEs score or Adverse Childhood Experience Score. So there are 10 kinds of trauma. You don't have to remember all these. No test at the end, right? But I just want you to think about this. 10 kinds of trauma that we measure when we look at how much a child has been troubled by their past. Five of them are very personal. I was physically abused. I was verbally abused. I was sexually abused. I was physically neglected. I was emotionally neglected. Things that actually happened to the child. Five of those uh, kinds of childhood trauma are related to family members. So even if I wasn't neglected or abused, if I have a parent who's an alcoholic, an active and recurring alcoholic, a mother who's a victim of domestic violence, a family member in jail, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, or the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or abandonment, or by being removed from your family by the system, those are all things that are also part of a child, uh, part of a child's adverse childhood experience score. The higher the score, the more of these things that have happened to a child, the higher that score, the more trauma. Now we have to understand, and I'm going to try to say this. Um, uh, you know, I've been to trauma workshops, and they use these great big fancy. It sounds like they ate a textbook and spit it out or something. What you really need to understand about trauma, it's not just your thinking memory of an experience. Trauma isn't just, oh, that happened to me, and when I think about it, that's bad. But trauma literally changes your brain. So when you are a child and you are exposed to trauma, even if you don't remember that trauma, it has changed the way that your brain functions. So when you're thinking about that kid, why doesn't he just do this? Because that's what your brain would do. You're forgetting that his brain has been trained differently. Now, trauma carries a physiological or a body memory, which often begins before we even have a, a memory in our mind. 
So remember what I said about how it changes your brain and how your brain functions. And oftentimes this trauma for these kids happened before they even knew they were being traumatized. So you get kids who come into foster care, they're not even a year old yet. They have no memory as such, but they're already traumatized. Not only does, has their brain been changed in its development, but they have a physiological or body memory response. So think of it kind of as a flinch response. I had four older brothers, right? And so uh, one of the things you used to have in our family is one of my brothers would pretend like, you know, he was going to, uh, you know, like punch my arm. And if I flinched, then he would say, two for flinching, right? So uh, the, the idea was, you're not supposed to flinch. Guess what? These kids flinch from everything. It's not a thinking response. It's an instinctive, brain-trained, fight-or-flight response. So when something happens to you at work, and maybe inside you'd like to blow up and say, you're a jerk, but you don't because your brain kicks in first and you go, yeah, he is a jerk, but we're not going to say that, right? For these kids, their flinch response, their instinctive response, when that trauma gets triggered is to, to, to their brain goes into fight or flight and their behavior reacts immediately. Their brain doesn't react immediately in terms of a thinking response. What happens is a physiological response. And then we call that a behavior or a meltdown, or we have words that we call it, but what you've got to understand is that the child doesn't think, I'm going to pitch a fit now. The child doesn't think, I'm going to have a meltdown now. The child doesn't think. Their body, their little physiological body memory, their rewired brain has a flinch response that is, that is instinctive. And it probably had survival benefits when the child was not safe. And you would think, well, now that they're safe, it should just go away. Well, guess what? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So for a lot of kids, what it leaves is PTSD symptoms. Now, PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. So somebody who's been exposed to trauma will then have certain characteristics that they carry with them. Sort of like, you know, if you have a, an injury to your ear, it can impact your hearing. If you have any kind of injury, it can impact the way your body functions. Well, in the same way, if you have an injury to your, essentially to your brain, to how your brain functions during crisis or stress, then it can carry some of these uh, problems with it. So what are some of the problems you're going to see in foster kids? They have problems sleeping. Oh yeah, like, like you didn't know that, right? But remember, it's not that they're just not wanting to go to bed or that they, uh, uh, you know, they're crying and they're getting you up in the middle of the night and you're frustrated by them. Then what's going on is happening in their brain, is happening in their brain. They might feel depressed or grouchy. Now, some of you are probably feeling a little depressed and grouchy right now, but... They've been feeling that probably the most of their life. They're nervous, they're jittery, they're alert, they're watchful, they're on guard. So for anybody else, if somebody raises their voice and says, knock it off, to get the rest of your kids might not be a big deal. But to a foster kid, when they're already nervous and jittery, when their body is already in high response and your voice is raised, uh, that kicks in their trauma response. They lose interest in things they used to enjoy. So you've got kids that don't want to do the things other kids want to do. You say, hey, kids, let's go outside. And you're trying to make it fun in a game. And your foster kid's like, me. And you're thinking they just have a rotten attitude. Yeah, that might not just be a rotten attitude. You might have to understand that they have lost what they knew. Now, a lot of people now, oh, my goodness, you go on Facebook and it's blowing up with people saying, oh, my God, I'm isolated. I don't know what to do. I can't go anywhere. Oh, you'd think that people, wait. Right? Here people are being asked to stay in their homes and they're going crazy. These kids lost their homes. They lost what they knew as their life. And even if their life looks to you like it wasn't a good life because mom and dad were using or mom and dad were mentally ill or whatever, it was the life they knew. I want you to think about your response right now to losing the life you knew, right? You're not going to work anymore. You're not able to just go out with friends anymore. You're... And what is that doing to the population at large? Well, this has already happened to these kids before this happened. These kids may seem detached, 
numb, unresponsive. So again, you're trying to get them fired up to do things and they seem unmotivated. They seem unmotivated because that's part of being traumatized and having long-term stress. They may be more aggressive than they would have been before. Some of these kids even get violent and we see that as a behavior. He needs to knock that off. Well, again, that's like saying to somebody who's having a heart attack, you need to knock that off. When a kid has a physiological response and he's just lashing out, it may not be enough to just tell him he needs to knock it off any more than a doctor telling you to knock off your cardiac arrest is going to be effective. Um, they may want to stay away from certain kinds of places or situations or things that bring back memories. You don't understand why they're acting like this. Um, you know, why don't they want to go in the shower? Why don't they want to do this? Why do they? And you just can't figure it out. And you might even say to them, how come you don't like baths? How come? They don't even know. Right? Remember when I said that's a body memory, that's a physiological response that they can't even understand themselves. Uh, they often are, have more difficulty being affectionate. And so you're open to them, but they're not open back to you. They've already lost what they hoped was their, their family affection. Um, so they can have flashbacks, things that are triggered by images or sounds or smells or feelings or situations. So it could be going on really fine, and all of a sudden, there's a meltdown. All of a sudden, there's a huge behavior problem. And you're like, well, I'm going to do this. This is a, he needs a consequence for this. And as we're going to talk about in a future podcast, helping these kids is not all about consequences. It is about us being much better detectives so that we look for what happened before this child melted down. We got to become much better at seeing what creates these meltdowns, what creates these behaviors, because many times these behaviors are being triggered by something from the child's past. Not that you did something bad, but whatever it is that you did triggered something from the past. Now, when this happens, a child can feel inside their body, they feel like the event is happening again. They are as scared as they were when the event was happening. So um, somebody yells at somebody, and maybe you're not yelling at the child, but somebody yells and the kid shuts down. They feel the same way inside their body as they felt when dad was beating on mom. And those kids can reenact that event for seconds, hours, sometimes even days. And so it's not like, you know, it's like breaking your leg. You don't just say, oh, well, now they set it straight, I'm good to go. It takes weeks, sometimes months for that leg to get fixed. Now, here's what you also know, any of you who have actually broken something, even after they say it's all fixed and you get the cast off and you're running around, it will probably still bother you when the weather changes or whatever. All right, what else can kids do from PTSD? They can act younger than their age. They might do thumb sucking, bedwetting. Uh, they can have physical symptoms. So it can be things like headaches, stomach aches. And the more tension they're under, the more you're likely to see these symptoms manifest themselves and manifest more strongly and more often. So here's my question. Are any of you feeling these things? Are you having problems sleeping? Are you feeling grouchy? Are you feeling nervous? Are you having trouble feeling affectionate? Right? Every time somebody says certain words, you just say, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Right? You've had it with the pandemic. Right? So these kids came to you already feeling what some people are now feeling related to the pandemic. So remember, it's a perfect storm that creates trauma and PTSD. Parental mental illness, uh, parental addiction or mental health problems, poverty, right? And it creates this trauma and this PTSD before they ever get to you, not because somebody tried to or meant to, but it happened. It, and, and nobody meant this to happen any more than you meant to break your leg. But once it's happened and the storm is over, right? There's still a great deal of work to do takes a great deal of effort when this perfect storm is over, it takes a great deal of effort for people to recover, right? The perfect storm is over, the tree has been uprooted, right? By its roots, this child has been taken out of their home from their roots and getting this tree to grow straight and tall and strong again is difficult work. It's very delicate work. You don't just plop it back in the ground no, it, you get it back in the ground. You've got to make sure that you water it. You've got to stake it up there, right? We, we know this. 
So how could we imagine that just bringing a child into our home and being nice to them would solve the problem? Now, the other thing is that once somebody has experienced PTSD, it recurs more easily. In other words, once you've had it, like these kids have, then any event that creates more trauma is more likely to result in more PTSD. So you haven't perhaps had a PTSD experience. Maybe you have. But for these kids, all the tension, all the stuff that's going on related to the pandemic, and, and you think, well, we're not talking about it in front of the kids. You don't have to talk about it in front of the kids. Kids can pick, these kids especially, they are feeling thermometers. They can feel tension, they can feel anger, they can feel frustration. You don't have to say a word, they can feel it. Ever been in a situation where somebody says, no, I'm not upset, and you knew they were. These kids are like that. So uh, events that other people get through are more difficult for these kids. So yes, everybody's going through the pande de pandemic, but it's more difficult for these kids, especially any event that contains emotional tension, hello pandemic, feelings of not being safe, hello pandemic, rapid uncontrollable change, hello pandemic, rapid uncontrollable change. I go to school? No, I guess I don't go to school. All right, now what do foster kids need? Well, foster kids need, in many ways if you can think of it as what foster kids need is what, is what your biological kids needed when they were babies, right? Because what we want to do is we want to, we want to, we want to make them do the right thing. We want to consequence them. We want them to learn from us. But you know what? That's not how we treat babies. What we do with babies is we give them sameness, consistency, structure. Now, too often people think consistency means every time you do this, you're going to get put in the chair. Consistency also means they get to bed at the same time every night. They have meals at the same time every day. They have a time that's, that's for resting. They have a time where they can just have some alone time and, and do a favorite activity. It's not just consistency in discipline. It's consistency in love. It's consistency in, in many other ways as well. So they have lost their sameness. Even if the family they came from had a lot of problems, it was the same problems over and over and over again. Now they're in your home. Everything's different. Everything's different. And so your sameness is not the same for them. And then they lost whatever sameness they had, meaning they'd adjusted to your home, and now they're in a new school, and now they understand their childcare or whatever, and now it's all different. It's all different for you, it's all different for your spouse, it's all different for these kids. Now what they need, what traumatized kids need is calmness around. You know how a baby can pick up when you're upset? They can, they're pre-verbal. They don't have to understand what you're saying. They can pick up when, you're, when they're upset. Here's what we know about babies. What creates that first step that babies go through is what we call the safety or security stage. There's this famous person who wrote these stages of human development. And he said, what babies need is to develop a sense that they're safe, that they're secure, that if they cry, somebody will come and take care of them. If they're hung, hungry, somebody will come and feed them. So for those of you who have a child who's been uh, diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, it means that at the time where they needed to know that they were safe, that an adult would come and meet their needs, mm -hmm. that they were safe in their world, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen not because their parents didn't love them, but because their parents were so disabled by drug or alcohol addiction or mental health problems that they were unable to do that. So they didn't get it when they were babies, which means they need it even more now. They need more of a sense of security, more of a sense of safety. So that means calm. Oh, that means, you know, the post at the end of the field. And that is not creating more trauma for kids who are already traumatized. Now, what they also need, number four, somebody who understands their particular response to stress. So remember when I said you have to pay attention to what happens before 
their behavioral outburst? We have to understand who this kid is. Is it when, does he have sensory issues? So if noises are too loud, or if too many people are around, or it, right, is it a sensory issue? Because if that's an issue they have, then how can you help them with that? Uh, do you have a child who has meltdowns uh, when it comes to transitions? Because if that's the case, then certainly you're gonna to need to watch for how do they transition best and then take that, what you learned, well, he transitions best if we warn him five minutes ahead of time. He transitions best if he has a little timer that he can see. He transitions best if he has a little egg timer that he can watch the sands go down. You have to pay attention. Who is this kid? What are his issues, right? And what is their particular response to stress? Because with some kids, when they feel stressed, they get boundaryless and they either cannot leave you alone they cannot let you go you're trying to do homeschooling and they are just melt you know melting down all over the place and it really is because they're so stressed they can't manage themselves and what they need is to feel that calmness that safety that security you think they need a consequence when what they need is a half hour where they learn on your lap they just need that that long-term hug. What else do they need? They need to not have triggers from their past trauma experience, from the experience they had probably in their own biological home. And what are a lot of those triggers? Triggers are hollering. Now, hollering to you might mean one thing, but to a child who's been traumatized, even raising your voice, even looking upset can be traumatizing because when that happened before, he got hit. You're not gonna hit these kids, but when you raise your voice, that trauma experience or that memory of when somebody raised their voice and then hit them that memory of when somebody uh, uh somebody looked upset and then hit their mom so it isn't it isn't just that it's your voice or your upsetness it's that it triggers an old memory that they don't even necessarily it's not like they have a memory like they go oh this reminds me of my mom oh this reminds me of my dad it is that body response that flinch response what else is a trigger any kind of tension around them, even if it's unexpressed. So you and your spouse are thinking, we're doing really good. You know, we don't talk about any of this stuff around the kids. You know, even though we're really worried about money, what are we going to do? You know, because uh, she can't go to work. She was working at a restaurant. Now she can't go to work. And how are we going to pay for all these kids? And now we have them home every day. Now we're feeding them two more meals a day. What are we going to do? You've got all this tension. You're not talking to them about that, but they can feel that tension. They can feel it. Anxiety and caregivers, again, even if it's unexpressed, they can feel it. So your best thing for what these foster kids need is to make sure that you're watching for your own hollering or looking upset or raising your voice or paying attention to your own tension and dealing with your own tension. Now, does that mean that you're going to know a way to pay your bills? No, but if there's nothing you can do about it, what do we teach them? One, three, ten, right? One, uh, 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 say the word relax. I'm going to relax. Uh, take three deep breaths <laughs> and then count to ten, right? So using those same things that you want them to do to reduce their tension, doing that. But, you know, well, you also notice that it says there and it's underlined, good luck with that, because guess what? We are feeling all those things. We are feeling tense. We are feeling anxious. We are feeling... <laughs> well, so much for my lovely background. <laughs> Apparently, I moved around too much. <laughs> Remember when I said I might sneeze? Well, or the background could fall down. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, good thing it's not too messy back there. Just some flowers. Uh, what else do these kids need? Somebody who hears what their behaviors mean instead of these think instead of thinking that these kids are mean let me say that again what these foster kids need is someone who hears what their behaviors mean not somebody who thinks these kids are being mean and that's what this is about tonight you have got to be able to see these kids for who they are traumatized kids who are going to respond to this added trauma through behaviors and if we respond to their behaviors instead of what they're feeling inside 
we're in trouble. So we need you to be responding to their feelings, not their behaviors. They're not going to be able to tell you what those feelings are. So if you said, what's going on with you? They're not going to be able to say, well, I'm feeling really scared because everybody seems really tension anxious. They don't even know. Doesn't do any good to say, what's wrong with you? How many psychiatrists did you go to, right? All they know is that, that kids can't articulate all their feelings, so they act them out. We call that acting out. Clever, isn't it? Now, what do foster kids need the most? What do they need the most? Two things I really want you to remember from tonight. The post at the end of the road. And this is the post at the end of the road. This is what these kids need the most. Not to have a placement disruption. Now, what's a placement disruption? A placement disruption is when we get to the point where we throw in the towel, we call a social worker, and we say, get this kid out of my house. That is the worst possible outcome for foster kids. Now, does it come to that for some foster parents? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it comes to that because of their concern about their biological children or because of their own mental health or whatever. I'm not saying that it never comes to that, but I am saying you cannot escape knowing that that is the worst possible outcome for most foster kids. So, <clears throat> our behaviors are probably worse right now during the pandemic and we're trying to work from home and we're trying to homeschool these kids and we don't know how to do that. And our emotions are on high. These kids are thermometers of our, emo of our adult emotions, even our unexpressed ones. As your anxiety and tension rise, their behaviors rise right with them and their behaviors get worse. They don't plan it any more than you plan to become anxious, any more than you plan to have a bad night's sleep. But that's how they manage stress. They manage stress through their behaviors. It comes out as behaviors. We think it's a teachable moment. You know you can't just grab the remote from your sister. You know you can't write on the walls. You know you can't hit. You know we think it's a teachable moment. These are not times of teachable moments. Most of us use some form of what I called earlier ABC parenting. This is not a time where we should be focusing on those little daily things of ABC parenting, right? Remember what I said, the story about the swapping? What we're gonna be looking at is, what's the end result we want here? Stability for these foster kids. If you focus on their behaviors and you try to use the BC part of ABC parenting, which is he did a behavior and he's gonna have a consequence. If you use that portion of ABC parenting, you'll be doing nothing but consequencing these kids for bad behaviors. Because as their tension levels rise, their behaviors are going to rise. This is not a time to focus on consequences, not a time to focus on bad behaviors. This is a time to focus on antecedents. In other words, what are the things that happened just before, just before? And this is a time to focus on our end goal. And that end goal is when this is all over, we want this child not to have experienced yet another foster care placement. Now I could go through all the things we know about what happens to kids who are bounced from foster home to foster home, because there is a ton of literature about that. But I'm not going to make you read it all. I'm just going to tell you, it's not good. So all the things that you've done already so far to try to help this child will get wiped away, wiped away, wiped away if the child is sent away from your home because of their behaviors. Again, what's placement disruption? It's a line in the sand where we throw in the towel, call the social worker, say, get the kid out. Why is it so important not to do this? Because the kids have already lost one home, their parental home. Some of them have already lost a number of foster homes. And while we see that as, well, we had to take him out because his parents were doing this, that, and the other thing, that's not how they see it. They see it as they lost their home. And you know how they see it? Because kids can't do abstract thinking. That doesn't happen until much later in human development. How kids see that as 
I got thrown away. People didn't care. Now, they may deny that. They may say, my parents love me. I hate you. But the fact of the matter is, on some level, most kids in foster care feel like they got thrown away. That leads to them feeling that they're not lovable, that they have no worth, that, they're, that nobody's going to care about them, that nobody can care about them because they're so horrible. Here's what we do know. Kids who think nobody cares don't follow rules. Let's go say that again. Kids who think nobody cares don't follow rules. So most of the time when people do parenting classes, they focus on, well, this is what you do when your kid does this. The fact of the matter is if your child doesn't want to please you, it won't matter what consequences you use. The first thing that has to happen with a child is bonding, attachment, right? That's why when babies are born, we don't try to consequence them. We don't, we don't try to teach them anything. We just love them and love them and love them. They ruin our sex life, right? <laughs> right? They, they pee on us, they poop on us, and we just love them. What if you thought of your foster kids that way? Yeah, they're going to ruin your sex life, and they're going to kind of piss on you, and they're going to kind of make you feel like shit, but, but you got to just love them in spite of all those behaviors. Because if they feel hurt by the people they love, they start to not care who they hurt. And that is the worst possible outcome for their future. Because then they don't care about themselves either. So what's the cycle? They come into your home. You begin to work on that Ericksonian thing we talked about, having them feel safe, having them feel secure, showing them that they're loved. But even in normal foster care situations, most foster kids will test this. So at some point in the foster care placement, they will start to act out, essentially to prove to themselves whether or not they really are lovable. Too often, foster parents see that as, well, this kid's not following the rules. He's going to have to go live somewhere else. Thinking it's a behavioral issue, and it's not a behavioral issue at all. It's the kid saying, okay, um, can you really love me? And if the child gets placed in another foster home, the message a child gets is, yeah, they said they loved me, but they really didn't. But right now, right now during the pandemic, which is why I'm sitting here in a falling down theater, is they're not just testing if you love them. They're responding to all the trauma and tension and anxiety in this pandemic world. There are going to be more bad behaviors. There will be more bad behaviors because that's their language that they're scared. Your temptation will be to use more discipline. And what they really need is more reassurance, more distraction, more calmness. So here's the other thing we know is that more discipline given to behaviors that are related to trauma responses doesn't work. So if somebody's having a meltdown because of a trauma response and you think he's just being a brat, and you consequence the kid, you might get him to stop doing it, but it is not something he or she is going to learn from. Because what they need in the time of a trauma response is safety, security. So if you're using discipline for behaviors that are related to a trauma response, another feeling that the kid has, you get frustrated because their behaviors don't change. So then the tension increases in your home, their behaviors increase more. Do you hear the cycle here? The worst case scenario is you start thinking, well, they're not respecting me. They're not respecting my rules. They're going to have to learn. How much can you learn when you are scared? So if we don't stop this cycle, you call and ask them to, ask to have them removed because they're not getting better. And then you think, there, well, we solved the problem. There. Now they'll learn they can't act like that. Oh, no. I didn't know how this works at all. Because guess what? Now the child is back at number one. Again, they're in a new foster home. And that foster parent is working on that Ericksonian thing. And then they're going to have to see if that foster parent really loves them. And they're going through the pandemic as well. And they're just feeling less lovable, less worthy, more traumatized. Because they couldn't tell you I'm scared. 
They can't say, inside my body, when everybody else is tense, I just lose my stuff. What is the message to a foster child if they're asked to leave? You are not lovable. You are not good enough. Nobody wants you around. Not only didn't your biological parents want you, we don't want you either. You think the message is, you can't act like that in our house. You can't be like that in our home. You think the message is, you're not following the rules. That's not what they hear. That is not what they hear. Those of us who have, who have worked with foster kids over the years, we know what that child internalizes. And it's not, you got removed because of your bad behavior. What they feel inside them is one through four. And they feel it to the depths of their heart. They will never see a new placement as a consequence of their behaviors. What they will think is just, that's how rotten I am. And the more rotten they feel, the less they want to please people because they just think they're so different from everybody else that no one can ever love them. So they feel it's, if they are moved from house to house, they think it's a consequence of their being unlovable, of their not ever deserving a family. So we have to take a look at these kids. If we start responding to the stress of the virus, they are going to respond to us. So what's the most important thing to remember from this first night of our series? Life is not usual for you. Nothing about what's going on today is similar to what was going on four weeks ago. And life is going to get more different. We get that. It's not easy when your life totally changes. But your foster child has gone through life not being the same before. So what you're going through now, they already went through. And as you start to get tense, they get more tense. Just as you're struggling now, they were struggling before. So somebody sent a thing on Facebook today that says, stop telling me that I should just look at the positive side. Stop telling me that I shouldn't feel this way. Like, yeah, adults on Facebook are doing that. But how many times have we tried to tell these foster kids, you just need to calm down. But now, as we're tense and we're struggling, their struggles are multiplied. This pandemic confuses and scares adults. But that creates PTSD triggers for foster kids. The more they feel tension and anxiety, the more they get triggered. They don't have the language for fear. I don't care if they're 16 years old. They don't have the language for fear. They speak through their actions. They speak through their behaviors. So listen to their actions as fears, not as bratty behaviors. What do we ask you to watch out for? I just talked about what we want you to remember. Here's what we want you to watch out for. We want you to watch out for expecting them to act like life is usual. It's not usual. We want you to watch out for thinking that kids can learn when they're scared. You know, as we move forward in the series, if you decide the series would be helpful, we're going to talk about how realistic is it you're going to be able to teach foster kids what the schools were struggling to teach them. And now you're supposed to teach them at home without a teaching degree. So we're going to talk about how do we try to manage that. Kids can't learn when they're scared. We'd like you to watch out for thinking that their behaviors are about being disrespectful or thinking that their behaviors are planful, that they're doing it on purpose. We also want you to watch out for losing your patience when they're in fear. We want you to watch out for your tension and your anxiety triggering more PTSD in them. We want you to watch out for focusing on their behaviors, but instead, we mostly want you to focus and watch out for your response during this very stressful time. So again, last thing I wanna say, what's most important is keeping these kids in your home through this. Whatever the pandemic holds for us, however hard it is for us as adults, they've already been through trauma. We want these kids to have no more messages that they are not wanted. Remember, 
the post at the end of the field. And what's your goal? To keep this kid safe, not just physically safe from the virus, yes, that too, but to keep this kid safe in your home, safe from a placement disruption. Because the most important thing you can give them during this is a sense that they are safe. All those other lessons you want to teach them about good behaviors and manners and all those other life lessons can wait. And they're going to learn them by seeing how you manage yourself. Thank you for joining us tonight on behalf of the Children and Family Services Training Center from the University of North Dakota. And on behalf of myself, Deb DeWitts and Family Resource Consultants, we'd like to thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again. Okay, well, I, I thank Deb for her time and sharing her wisdom with us. Uh, we do wanna be mindful of people's time and we do understand that it is after eight o'clock. Um, now, with that being said, um, if you have to go attend to, to kiddos and your family and life, you are more than welcome to, to cut out now. Uh, just wanted to kind of lay out a couple final details and then we also have kind of a, a dialogue we'd like to have with folks. So don't jump off if you don't have to, uh, by all means. But uh, we will be um, mailing out an evaluation. I would love feedback and I know Deb would like that as well. Uh, so please feel free to um, share, share kind of some open thoughts on that. Um, within that evaluation, you'll also get a, um, the option of printing out a certificate as kind of for your own records. If you're looking for a social work CEU certificate, uh, please comment in the chat box or email me um, and I'll be sure you get those out uh, in the next few days. Uh, but want to kind of open up now for some, for some dialogue if folks have thoughts. Of course, we um, had a wealth of information uh, that was covered, but like we said, and as Deb really laid out nicely, um, we're, we're living in this, this uh, chaotic, unprecedented time of a pandemic. And the whole uh, purpose, uh, the whole dialogue that me and Deb really had was how can we, how can we provide something um, for families? Like we said, we don't have all the answers. Not every single bit of piece of information that Deb shared tonight may fit perfectly within your home, um, uh, but we want to see what else we can offer you. So me and Deb have come up with a nice long list of other topics that will we'll potentially be open to covering, um, but wondering if anyone has any thoughts in the chat box that you want to put out there as things that you'd like us to cover in the future. The other wonderful piece about Deb is, is even though me and her have talked about this, uh, she is she's really mindful and understanding that if there's something out there that you think we can help provide, maybe Deb's not the fit for that. Uh, in the sense of, she said, you know what, our state is full of other um, experts and topics and uh, whether, uh, whether I think Deb has a, a great wealth of knowledge to share and a lot of life experiences and things like that, um, that I think can really fit well for some of the things we would like to cover. We do understand that there are other um, places where we maybe need to travel through this journey. Um, so like Deb said, we're, we're looking towards the end of that end of that uh, field and seeing kind of where, where this journey takes us, none of us know. Um, but wondering if anyone has any other thoughts. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of just kind of, you know, thank you pieces in the comments, that sort of thing. There was some good dialogue that happened with, with folks um, as they kind of um, had the pieces of information kind of resonate for them. Uh, also, people loved when Deb lost her backdrop, right? Um, people loved the reality, which I agree. So, um, yeah. So I'm seeing some comments come in. I'll maybe take a peek at those. Deb, I don't know if you have anything you want to share right now. Um, I just would like to underscore what she just said. And that is, I love what's going on in the chat box right now. Um, uh, you're talking about, they're saying, could we do a webinar for foster kids? Uh, mm -hmm. Could we do something so that kids would have a chance to connect with each other? I think that's a great idea. Um, so that's what we're wanting you to do is exactly what people are starting to do. Somebody says, how about transitioning an adoptive child, right? Um, so put in the chat box some ideas of things you'd like to see. Because it, it might be, we don't know what your worries are right now. Somebody might be saying, my biggest worry is, a legal worry. What if the child gets sick and under our care, you know? Um, so, um, so chat them in.
because we aren't going to have answers for everything tonight, mm -hmm. but chat them in. We'll take a look at those things. Um, the other thing I guess we need to know is, do you want more? You know, was, was this like, well, that was a good hour, but that was enough. Or, do you, oh, okay, so two people want more. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's what we need to know. If, if this is something that was worth your time, then we're willing to put in the time to try to do this again. And so um, the more you can tell us about particular things you'd like us to cover, um, and, and here's the thing, uh, it, not just tonight, but as your week goes on and things are happening, email Amy and say, Amy, this is what's driving me crazy right now. And, and let her know, we would like this to be covered. Now, we're not going to be able to cover every topic for every family, for every foster child. But um, uh, it's, uh, one of the things that uh, somebody just said is a, a time where foster parents could just talk with each other, right? Not have somebody telling you what to do, but just open up the mics and let people talk. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're wanting to do. Uh, is is just get information from you about um, uh, uh, oh somebody just said understand why a fourteen year old is like an eight year old oh that would be uh, yeah I mean these are great ideas um, we'd be happy to just stay open for a while uh, let people talk somebody said what if we did smaller groups right so mm -hmm. if we had people come together but there is a way to put people into smaller groups uh, on Zoom mm -hmm. so that it's not 200 people uh, trying to talk and answer. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is what we're looking for. Just give us some feedback tonight. Uh, email Amy. If you know other good speakers that you would like Amy to approach, um, you know, they might have to be people who are willing to do it for not a lot of money, because guess what? Everybody's <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, the uh, Children Family Services Training Center didn't plan for the pandemic either. And right. so, uh, so, uh, uh, let's see, would it be possible? And I'm, and I'm seeing that someone's asking about, like, maybe how departments are responding. Uh, we did have a contact uh, with the Children and Family Services Division, um, and they're saying that they, they want to be responsive as well. Um, so we could certainly reach out to... Uh, folks up there at the division and see how we could we could partner with them um, by all means. You know, I think one of the interesting pieces of this is, is, you know, me and Deb kind of created this like what if plan. I don't know. I don't know who's going to show up. Anyone going to come? Created very last minute. All of you know that literally I sent out uh, a flyer 48 hours before we rolled this out. Uh, so to have close to 250 registrants, which some of those are two parent households, like we said, uh, so we had a number of folks on tonight, um, by all means. Uh, to me, that was powerful in a lot of ways. Um, one, um, that, that folks uh, were tuned into their email and trying to get all those updates that we all are um, in regards to where this pandemic is leading us and all of that, as well as, um, you know, we have just some rock star uh, foster parents, adoptive parents, just caregivers in general that way, as well as we had a number of professionals on tonight. and. Um, I guess I just kind of want to give a shout out personally, and I'm guessing I can put words into Deb's mouth as well here, uh, in the sense of like, I just, I'm so impressed that in amongst all of this, even though maybe you had life happening in the background uh, with kids and families and you're getting supper done and now you're maybe kind of getting, you know, um, bedtime routine started, uh, you guys made time for this. And I guess that speaks volumes. That does speak volumes to me about how just, you're, you're showing up to do the hard work and in crisis. I mean, all of us are trying to figure this out. We're struggling as adults with the uncertainty. So for you guys to, to show up for the kiddos in your care or professionals and who are trying to do their best as well, um, I just, I thank you from the bottom of my heart that you took the time to tune in for this hour. Uh, and, and I want to yeah. thank you from the bottom of my heart just for being foster parents. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's just the best. So... So, hey, hi, yeah. Rodden, Tracy. <laughs> so, uh, like Deb said, uh, we can keep the chat box open for those of you who want to dialogue more ideas out there. We're certainly going to try to attend to them. We won't have answers for all of them. Um, if we did, um, gosh, yeah, we would be in a bigger business, right? Uh, but anyways, so be, be sure to, you know, as you're encountering things in your home, and your life, uh, if you're connecting with other foster parents or people like that, 
and you guys are coming up with those concerns about like, what about this and what about that? I'm struggling. Um, we're we're going to try to be here for you. I don't know what that's all going to look like. I know. Another thing had... I want to be sure we underscore is that while I said that everything's changed and, you know, uh, foster parent uh, or foster care workers are probably trying to have to work from their homes and other social workers are, you know, like your case workers, they're all under these same stresses too, but they are still working. So do keep in touch with your workers. Let them know what's going on if there's a problem. So we don't want you to think that because I talked about isolation, that means that you're supposed to stay isolated. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really wanting you to, to stay in touch with the people that are still trying to provide services. So, uh, okay, somebody said, how do we prove to our worker that we watch this? So Amy, will you be able to send out an email to yeah. everybody who attended kind of saying, uh, this is how you get credit? Yep, so, so again, how we get credit is, is I have a list of all of you guys who are logged in um, and with that participant list, it will be a nice long list. Uh, for this evening's reading, we've never had any had this volume ever for a webinar, uh, and so with that being said, I'll take that participant list and I'll share it out to those licensing agencies, um, both your county zones. I think they're both it's a number of agencies, right? County zones, uh, your our treatment foster care path, LSS, youth work, tribal folks, all of that sort of thing, and we will we will go ahead and and share that list with them so they can have that verification. The other way is, is I'll be sending out an evaluation. I'm hoping to get it out yet this evening. At the bottom of that evaluation, there is a certificate that you can download. Now, if you complete the survey on your phone, you can just maybe screenshot the certificate. If you're doing it on a, a desktop computer, laptop, that sort of thing, and you have a way to print that off, you can print that off your records. Um, but often I just have people tell me that they screenshot it and then they, they either keep it as a, as a picture or they email it to their worker, whatever that way. Um, so you, you can have that, but we always have a master list here of who's all attended. Um, we can see who uh, has been in for a few minutes and we can see who's been in for the entirety of the session. So we can verify that, that you were indeed present for this hour of training. So, um, and I just had a person just say, you know, my spouse and I both tuned in. Um, how do I know that you're both there? Uh, this is one of those rare places where um, we, do, we do trust the foster parent. Um, that you're going to be ethical and honest. So if you tuned in with a significant other spouse that way, um, you can comment in the chat box and just say, hey, um, it's not just John here, Jane's here as well, that sort of thing. So feel, feel free to, to comment in that regard. So the other thing that I want to say, uh, several people have mentioned some things about the whole issue of as they're rolling out this school thing, <laughs> um, you know, because that's rolled out in some states, in other states already. And, um, you know, again, if you've been on social media, you've seen the people who have, you know, at first there were all these funny things about, oh, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been responsible for my children's school for two days. I've already suspended one, uh, you know, kicked out the other one and blah, blah, blah. And it was funny for a couple of days. And now it's gotten really quiet mm -hmm. because parents are struggling with this. So one thing that I've been working on possibly if this uh you know we'll see what the comments all are tonight but to talk some about how do we try to integrate this issue of you know not that you'll be homeschooling you know it's not homeschooling but how do you support your kids as their school districts try to roll this out and they're supposed to be doing it in your home especially when you need the computer to go to work so uh, that is one topic that we're looking at perhaps doing uh next week but uh, we're gonna look at your chat box uh comments and uh, see what kinds of things you're recommending and you've got some speakers you recommended. Um, so, all right. Um, okay, I, I think that might be it for this evening. Um, I certainly don't want to cut off comments, but again, email um, either myself or if you want to reply uh, to the Children and Family Services Training Center, just our general email that um, as well. And uh, I guess uh, um, we will do our best to see what we uh, can tune in with next week. Um, I don't know the exact day for that yet. Me and Deb will work that out. Work uh, out. Um, you know, our schedules are a little bit free in the evening, right? We don't have another, a lot of other commitments um, with uh, being quarantined. Um, Where would I go? Time. Minnesota's <laughs> locked down. <laughs> That's true. You are in Moorhead, yes. I am in Moorhead. Um, so, so, yes. So, we will do our best to uh, provide another round of training next week. 
I uh, don't know the day, don't know the time, watch your emails. Uh, we will be posting it, like I said, through your email. We'll probably blast it on, on Facebook, uh, check our website, uh, and, and any of those things you have on that list that we can attempt, attempt is the keyword there, to tackle. Um, we will, we will try to do our best that way. So again, um, thank you all genuinely uh, for tuning in this evening. Uh, very much appreciate your time. Um, I appreciate Deb taking this on with me as we kind of shoot from the hip and see how we can uh, um, provide some kind of support out to folks. So thank you for your time as well, Deb. Um, until next week, if you can join us, great. If not, we will be recording so you can check our website if indeed you can't tune in for the live session. Um, or if your internet glitches, I know that was happening for some folks. Uh, and um, with that, I'm going to say, have a good rest of your evening. Stay safe. Take care. Stay healthy. Um, yes, right. Uh, and, and good luck as you try to navigate where this path takes us in the next week. So All until right. then, take Farewell. care. Good night. <laughs>